What would you do when seconds count? How would you react? Who would you call? Compared to other modes of transportation, aircraft crashes are rare. However, an average of 37 accidents occur nationally each week, amounting to about 1,900 annually. This number could increase as air travel increases. Even though an aircraft crash is unlikely to occur in your area, it is important to be prepared. Knowing what to do if you are the first on the scene of a crash could save lives. How you react could also affect the outcome of the crash investigation. Having a plan, a practiced plan, is critical. Most metropolitan airports, fire departments, and hospitals have emergency plans in place for handling many types of disasters. But airplane crashes don't always happen near a large city. They often occur in remote areas, in cornfields, canyons, or on mountainsides, far from emergency services. In many places where the counties are so widespread, an ambulance could be 20 or more minutes away. Some communities have taken the initiative to train first responders to give assistance until help arrives. They know what to do, who to call, and what information is necessary to aid authorities. More importantly, they practice their plan and keep it up to date with current information. But what are the necessary elements of such an emergency plan? And who is responsible for implementing them? Whether you are a county sheriff, an EMT, a state patrol, or police, you can make a difference by knowing what to do. And you can make sure your community is prepared. A plan can be as simple as a list of telephone numbers, or as complex as a mutual agreement between fire, police, medical, and military services. Having a plan in place for all levels of disaster can help to eliminate panic when an unfortunate situation arises. The investigation procedures for an aircraft crash are different from the procedures for an automotive crash or other disasters. So let's look at the critical elements of a plan for handling an aircraft crash. If you are the first on the scene, your job is to help the injured, notify proper authorities, and secure the area until further help arrives. In other words, rescue, advise, and guard. In most cases, these actions will happen simultaneously. Rescue. Stay calm and think of each of your actions through. Approach the wreckage cautiously. If you are in a motor vehicle, avoid approaching along the crash path as survivors may have been thrown out. This could also destroy valuable accident evidence. If possible, approach the site with the wind to your back in case of fire or hazardous material spill. Assess the situation. Is there potential for fire? If so, move survivors a safe distance away. Otherwise, do not disturb them except for rendering first aid. Most aircraft have a fire extinguisher under or behind a front seat. Although not required, many aircraft also carry first aid kits. Leaking fuel creates the biggest fire hazard. The fuel tanks are normally located in the wings of most aircraft. However, some fuel tanks are located in the fuselage. Sometimes the aircraft's electronic fuel pumps will continue to pump fuel after a crash. This increases the chance of fire or explosion. By turning off the master switch or battery switch, you can eliminate this and other dangers. Where are your master switches at? Down here? Okay, I'll get them. Don't worry about it. Just relax. The master switch is usually located within easy reach of the pilot. 
two common locations are the left bottom side of the instrument panel and the left bulkhead of the aircraft. The battery switch may be just a simple toggle switch. Once the master switch or battery switch is turned off, the only hot wire remaining is between the master switch and the battery. If possible, disconnect this wire to eliminate any further danger from electrical charge. In most single engine aircraft, the battery is located either on the engine firewall or behind the rear cargo space. In medium sized twin engine aircraft, the battery may be located in the nose cone. Be cautious where a pilot has made an emergency landing. Do not move the propeller. Even though the master switch and the magneto switches are off, the ground lead might have broken during a hard landing. And since the magnetos are still hot, the engine could start if the propeller is moved. While continuing to assess the situation, look for evidence of hazardous materials. Be alert for containers with hazardous material symbols on them. If there appears to be a hazardous material spill, approach only if necessary to help survivors. Approach with extreme caution. Cover your mouth and nose with a cloth and avoid touching or stepping on any materials. Assist survivors in moving a safe distance away. Ideally upwind, uphill, and upstream from the crash. Then stay away from the immediate crash area and wait for assistance. If there is the slightest reason to suspect the presence of hazardous cargo, including radioactive material or chemicals, delay handling the wreckage until it can be checked by qualified persons and declared safe. Crop dusters are one example of planes with hazardous materials. The pesticides and herbicides they carry can be very harmful to humans. Once the pilot is out of the aircraft and a safe distance away, stay away from the aircraft until help arrives. Determine from the operator, if possible, the type of material involved and its Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, registration number. Notify the appropriate agencies like the EPA, Poison Control Center, or related hazardous material agency for handling and cleanup procedures. Please realize it may be necessary to rescue people trapped inside the aircraft. Depending on the size and type of aircraft, access hatches and rescue points will differ. Larger aircraft have escape hatches that normally have distinguishable markings around the doors and escape routes. On smaller aircraft, access is usually through the main doors. Door handles vary with the type of aircraft. Many handles are similar to an automotive door handle. Others may have a double latch system. If you are not familiar with many aircraft, you might visit a local general aviation airport and look at several different makes and models of aircraft. This will familiarize you with how some door handles work, how markings appear around escape hatches and doors, where emergency equipment is stored, and how to locate the battery or master switch. Knowing these things can aid in the safety and efficiency of the rescue effort. Advise. Keep a list of important telephone numbers easily accessible. Update them often and make sure everyone knows where the list is located. These numbers should include local fire and police departments, ambulance service, hospitals, and the county coroner. It's important to include numbers for normal working hours as well as off-duty working hours, if different. Also include on your list the local Flight Standards District Office, known as the FISDO. The FISDO number for your area can be obtained by the Federal Aviation Administration or FAA. 
They can also give you an after-hours toll-free number for the automated flight service station or regional duty officer. Contact the FISDO as soon as possible after the crash. They will relay the information to other necessary federal agencies. The FISDO will want specific information when you contact them. Be prepared to provide the N number of the aircraft, generally located on the tail or the aft fuselage. The location of the accident, using the best directions you can. A local contact name and telephone number for the inspector to call for further information and directions. The aircraft type, single engine or multi-engine aircraft. The model, Cessna or Piper, is also helpful if known. The number of injuries or fatalities. You might include the total number of people on board if known. When the crash was discovered or reported. Don't hesitate to call the FISDO even if all this information is not initially available. If the crash is of a large scale, local area hospitals will need to be alerted. You might also advise the Red Cross, local clergy, and any other community service organizations that provide disaster assistance. Do me a favor, get in your truck and back it up a little bit, okay? I'll be right there. If you need me, I'll be right there. Okay, but I want you back over Guard. Right now, okay? As soon as possible, secure the area. Establish entrance and exit routes for emergency vehicles. This may involve removing fences or other obstacles. A no smoking rule should be established because of fire danger. Prevent handling or disturbance of the wreckage as much as possible. This should only happen to assist the injured or remove the deceased. Aircraft parts, instruments, throttle position, and similar items provide valuable clues to trained accident investigators. No one should be allowed inside the wreckage area other than those necessary for rescue and firefighting. The only exception to this is for the possible removal of mail or other cargo to protect it from further damage. Although you may be in a position to manage the accident scene, the pilot is ultimately responsible for the aircraft and its cargo. Provide any assistance requested by the pilot. Only if the pilot is not able to take charge should someone else do so. The FAA will need any certificates and logbooks from the accident scene. Protect them in any way necessary. Any items removed must be stored and protected locally for examination by investigators. If it's necessary to disturb or move the aircraft or victims, make sure descriptions are documented. Pictures or videos should be taken if possible. But notes and sketches are useful too. Include the original position of the accident and any significant impact marks. You should also note the position inside or outside the aircraft of any bodies before removing them. If you move any switches, keep track of those moved and notify the person in charge of the investigation. The position of a switch could be a key factor in determining the probable cause of a crash. In the event of fatalities, the coroner should be alerted not to embalm the bodies. The FAA will provide a kit called a tox box for pathological and toxicological examination prior to embalming. Well, News in 6, people rushing to the scene of a plane crash today. But... Spectators and news media are likely to arrive soon after a crash. Establishing a perimeter and maintaining some kind of barrier will ensure that those involved in the rescue effort are able to gain immediate access to the site. It will also ensure that the site remains as undisturbed as possible for the investigators. So you need to stay right here. There's some people hurt and everything. So you need to stay right here. What happened? Yeah.
the news media will be anxious to get as much information as possible. Care should be taken not to give reporters unnecessary information. You can tell them the type of aircraft involved, its end number, and the number of people involved in the accident. But until families have been notified, do not release the names of victims, identifying markings, or any other pertinent data. Give me just a second, I'll get an FAA representative over here to speak with you, okay? Is there anything you can tell us other than that right not now? Not right now, okay? Just hang on just a second. The National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, or FAA investigators will have the responsibility of guarding the site and handling the media when they arrive. Did it, any witnesses see what happened? The uh, there's a couple of witnesses. Uh, Tim here was the first one on the scene, and he probably answered the question. Rescue, advise, and guard. These are the basic elements of an aircraft disaster plan. But other circumstances also need to be considered. For example, different sizes and types of aircraft can present special problems. When dealing with military aircraft, always assume there are high explosives on board. If you are assisting a crew member in a military aircraft, do not raise, move, or tamper with armrests. They may activate an injection seat and are extremely dangerous. Look for orange and yellow markings on the outside of the aircraft to indicate escape hatches. Smaller aircraft tend to break apart or eject passengers more easily than larger aircraft. Parts are typically scattered over large areas, so be particularly cautious when approaching and protecting these sites. Climate and terrain are other elements to consider when developing an emergency plan for a particular area. Do you live in a coastal or mountainous region? Is it a heavily or sparsely populated region? Are there temperature extremes that need to be considered? Special equipment may be necessary for each regional emergency situation. For example, snowmobiles, helicopters, or different types of boats may be needed for search and rescue. In May of 1996, when Value Jet plunged into the Florida Everglades, airboats had to be used to search for survivors and wreckage. 74 passengers and five crew members crashed during a heavy snowstorm after first striking the 14th Street Bridge. And when an Air Florida jet crashed into the Potomac in 1982, helicopters quickly responded to help pull survivors out of the icy waters. Although few survived this accident, none would have survived if authorities hadn't prepared for the use of helicopters. Another situation to consider is a nighttime operation. High-powered lights should be available in the event of a crash at night. Since every emergency situation is different, try to plan for a variety of circumstances. In developing a plan for a community, prepare for both small and large accidents. The larger the scale, the more complex the plan will need to be. There must be coordination between the various agencies who typically respond in an emergency. It is advisable to have a lead agency establish roles and responsibilities. This helps to avoid confusion or duplication of services. Having a mutual aid agreement is a good idea, particularly when working in a multi-county area. But even as a member of a rural community or volunteer fire department, you can follow these basic guidelines for planning your response to an aircraft crash. Your informed efforts could minimize injury and loss of life, reduce property loss, and aid in determining the cause of the crash. Remember, the three critical elements of handling an aircraft accident are rescue, Approach cautiously. Render first aid until relieved by trained medical personnel. Be aware of fire and chemical hazards. Advise. Use your prepared list to notify fire, police, and medical personnel. Be able to provide directions to the site. 
Also notify your local FISDO as soon as possible with the required information. Guard. Protect the site from disturbance as best you can until investigators arrive. Above all, have a plan. Go over your plan on paper with others. It's also important to physically go through the motions of an emergency response by having realistic emergency drills. These drills will help to identify problems and minimize confusion and panic when the time comes to use it. Update your plan at least once a year. Review phone numbers and the names of key personnel. Each time the plan is reviewed or revised, date it so others will know the data is current. And make sure others know where the plan is located. By being prepared, you will know what to do when seconds count.